So, good afternoon, I'm Derek Weeks. I'm the Vice President of Product Marketing for Sonatype. We're a business focused on application security and open source development. In April of this year, I was privileged to be able to lead a survey of over 3,300 application security and open source development professionals. This is the fourth year that we've run this particular study where we've now had over 11,000 people participate in sharing their voice regarding open source development and application security issues. In the survey, we asked 28 different questions of these professionals, some of which we're going to cover here. We had, within the survey, we asked about open source development practices. We asked about open source governance policies. We asked about challenges associated and risks associated with application security in those development organizations. We had organizations that had anywhere from as few as 10 developers participating to organizations with hundreds or thousands of developers within them. We ask everyone from pen testers to IT architects to software developers themselves about their experiences with open source and application security. And we're going to share some of those results with you here. I think some of you have received some of the handouts or infographics with some of the results from the survey. And one of the reasons why this is relevant, I think we're all familiar with the OWASP top 10 and the A9, we shouldn't use components with known vulnerabilities. But open source is being used in huge, huge volumes. I think we're nearing over 20 billion open source <coughs> downloads, open source component downloads by developers worldwide. There are only about 11 million developers worldwide with those. We also know that applications are the number one attack vector leading to breach. With a lot of open source components being used within applications and a lot of attacks targeted toward these, the topic is becoming more and more important for us to address as an application security community. So with that, I've invited a, an all-star panel with me. Uh, they are seated in order of uh, beardedness. <laughs> <laughs> We had to figure out, you know, it was either by height, by age, but we figured, you know, length of beard was, uh, was appropriate. Even if I now? tried for weeks on end to grow a beard, I would probably still look like this <laughs> at the end of the day. <laughs> so uh, first let me introduce Jeff Williams. Uh, so we're honored to have Jeff uh, on the panel this afternoon. Jeff is a uh, co-founder and currently CTO of Contrast Security. He also co-founded and became CEO of Aspect Security. He's one of the earliest members of OWASP and sat on their board as chairman for eight years. So Jeff, welcome to the panel. Thank you. Damon Edwards, uh, currently co uh, a co-founder and vice president at Simplify Ops. They are a uh, firm that provides services and support for the Rundeck open source project Damon is very involved in the DevOps community, providing our developer perspective on the panel uh, today. He also co-founded uh, and remains active with DTO Solutions, which is a DevOps uh, consultancy firm uh, out there. So Damon, welcome to the panel. Thank you. Josh Corman is a colleague of mine at Sonatype. He's CTO of Sonatype. He is a world-renowned researcher and innovator Josh has been a security researcher prior to Sonatype uh, at IBM, the 451 Group, and Akamai. He's also a co-founder of Rugged Software along with Jeff. Uh, he also co-founded the I Am the Cavalry uh, movement. Josh, welcome. And then Matt Johansson, he is currently senior manager of the Threat Research Center at White Hat Security. Matt has years of experience in, in web application testing, pen testing. He has managed a group at White Hat Security that's responsible for assessing over 35,000 different web applications that White Hat has under contract. And he's also done university level uh, teaching for web, app, uh, web application security. So Matt, welcome. Matt J, welcome to the panel. 
So as we get into the, um, as we get into the discussion, I've heard that, sorry, I should have put the, uh, there are the Twitter addresses for these guys up there. I've heard that some shorter. of these guys are talkative. Um, and we don't want anyone dominating the conversation. So what we've decided to do and agreed with the panelists is everyone has two minutes to provide an answer or commentary or guidance for you within the statistics that, that have come up. Um, I will give these guys a little pass. I've made these little plus minute cards. Each guy gets one. If you feel <laughs> like you need an extra minute to you know, talk about what, whatever you want to contribute to the perspectives of the audience. You're allowed to use that once during the conversation. Josh looks like he took two there. Hacker. <laughs> <laughs> Not to say that Josh is the one on the panel that may need it, but um, anyway, so uh, welcome to the panel. Uh, we, we have a, we'll have a really engaging discussion here. I think it's important to, to understand we will present statistics that are exciting, intriguing, perhaps off-putting or, or concerning to some of you, but the stats are not what counts. It's really the takeaway from this discussion that we want you to take back to your organizations to begin the conversations. How good are we compared to everyone else? How up to speed are our practices with the rest of the community? Do we need to emphasize some new priorities for our organization? So while the stats will be interesting, take the all 3,300 participants, do you know someone, and we actually asked them explicitly, have you uh, experienced or do you suspect an open source related hack within your organization or attack within the past 12 months? Just by show of hands, you don't have to say that it was you. Do you know of someone that might have experienced an open source related breach in the past 12 months? Show of hands. Open SSL, anyone? <laughs> OK, so may, maybe 20% of the room. So out of, three, out of 3,300 participants of the survey, 373 noted, we suspect or we know there was a suspected open source breach with our, uh, our environment in the past 12 months. So surprises? We'll go with uh, Jeff for the latest commentary. Uh, it, I think it's tough to measure. I think a lot of people don't notice those exploits, so that you know the number could be considerably higher. But the fact that Heartbleed came out right in the middle of the survey um, probably biased the results somewhat. So uh, you know, I, it's definitely out there. I think we're going to see more and more exploits of open source components. So you know, you, sh you should hear about it. Yeah, what, what we found, the survey was run from April 1st to April 30th. And if you remember, April 7th was the initial Heartbleed announcement. That did change the responses that we got back from the people taking the survey. After that, 31% of the people, about 1,500 who answered, said that they had open source related or suspected open source related breaches. So in terms of application, Josh. I think one of the challenges is people don't know they're using open source or where they're using it. And I also think that when you do the investigations report as to root cause of breach, they don't get that granular. Um, so I did talk to the Verizon Business Data Breach Investigation guys, and they don't specifically try to map was this due to an open source vulnerability. But anecdotally, um, the Struts vulnerability last July took down just about every single financial services institution. Most of them got FBI letters indicating they were implicated in compromises due to that particular flaw. Uh, and then if you look at how many social media sites were affected by OpenSSL Heartbleed, I think Rob Graham's day one stats was 600,000 nodes directly connected to the internet uh, seem to be vulnerable on a superficial scan. So I, I don't think it's that they aren't having breaches due to open source. I think it's that they don't know it's due to open source. So Matt, are these open source related breaches avoidable? Uh, that's a loaded question. Um, so <laughs> that's why we're here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, of course they're avoidable, but uh, I think the problem comes down to even like like Josh said, like that you're even knowing what you're using, right? Knowing what components are even part of it. Um, we're lucky enough if people can can realize that it, it, a breach happened due to an application layer, 
vulnerability, right? right? right. Uh, never mind which moving piece of the machine was the, was the culprit, right? Um, it's like, oh, okay, they got into our database, then that's where the conversation ends, right? Okay, well, where was that SQL injection? Stuff like that, so. I'm gonna say it's not avoidable, not perfectly avoidable, like even if you were doing everything the best way possible, there's so much open source and the tax surface is so big. I mean, it, I don't think anybody's actually capable of keeping all their libraries totally up to date, but even if they could, there's still all the unknown vulnerabilities in those libraries, so they, they could get breached through vulnerabilities in that code that just nobody knows about. Uh, and you can't really avoid those. I, I don't think it's fair to expect people to do a manual pen test or manual code review on all of their open source components. Right. Well, I think there's two things. I mean, if you look, this is totally out of our domain, but if you look to the manufacturing world or the deep, uh, transportation world. You know, there's a lot of study in complex systems, you know, just disasters, and uh, it just shows that in a complex system you cannot control it, right? I mean, we learned this on the uh, you know, system side with outages, right? You just cannot say this component will never, ever, ever fail. Um, so you have to, and at least look on that side, you could build your world to, to, uh, to be protected. You can build your services to, 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 resist, um, to resist against that. I think the other thing we can learn here is that um, external inspection at a later point in the process just never keeps up with the process, right? I mean, if you go back to you know Toyota, Toyota and the quality mm -hmm. movement of uh, uh, Demine and Ono and all those folks, maybe I'm totally talking out of the domain here with the folks in this uh, room want to hear about, but it just shows that they that you know when you unless you bake quality in at the source and you, you do the inspection um, in the beginning, nobody can keep track of all the, the the components in a in a complex system. Especially, there's very few businesses out there that will ever employ a large enough. Security, security force uh, um, to, uh, to try to police and track everything down. So uh, Josh, before you yeah. uh, comment, Damon, in, in the DevOps community, mm -hmm. how much is application security on the radar <laughs> of DevOps professionals uh, around the world? Are, are we even on the radar in, in, in DevOps? Um, it is. Everyone here would say it's a concern. So. Yeah, and I think for everyone it's a concern. I think it's like saying, do you want to be more secure? Yes, right? Um, but I, I think what, what often happens is um, it's like, like the database. Like this is something we saw in, in the early DevOps movement that people <laughs> avoided dealing with the database folks. Right now it's kind of going, well, let's avoid dealing with the network folks, right? Because they've staked out this domain of their own. They have their own tools. They're hard to get a hold of. There's not enough of them. They're resource constrained. So people say, yes, I want to be, I, I, of course we want to be, be more secure, but it seems to be often pushed off to be another silo. It's somebody else's, it's, it's, it's somebody else's uh, problem. And if you look at DevOps as being primarily concerned about time to market and quality, um, you know, quality and security, you know, a, a, most folks aspect, it, <laughs> quality is an aspect of security. Have I gone over? Sorry. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, the, uh, oh, so yeah, so that's, that's going over. Uh, quality, at, security is a part of quality. But time to market's the other essential part, and if we stand in the way and we block the processes and we slow people down, they'll find a way to, to route around it. So not shockingly, I disagree with um, Jeff, but um, one of the things I think is avoidable, th if the question is, is the breach avoidable due to open source? No. Um, but there are categories of avoidable, right? So if it's an unknown, undiscovered flaw, there's going to be that in every latent amount of code. If it's a known vulnerability in an open source component and you could have looked and you could have removed it and it was completely elective and avoidable risk, you know, that's something that's easier to do. Um, and as a, as a perfect example, Bouncy Castle is my favorite one because it just drives a, stag a dagger through my heart. It had a CVSS t level 10 flaw seven years ago. They fixed it seven years ago. And despite it having a perfectly fixed version for the last seven years, our stats showed uh, like 1,400 downloads, downloading organizations last year that made it into 20,000 applications. That's 20,000 applications using an insecure crypto library for a security app. Completely avoidable, but no one's actually looking to see, is it past its expiration date? Does it have a big red alert on it for a uh, massively exploitable vulnerability? Like that's, to me, that is avoidable risk. Yeah. Yeah. So let, let's make a transition here in the, the conversation. So we know that there are bad components out there and we understand that we shouldn't be using them and perhaps you have a policy out there that r reserves or, or uh, restricts what open source components you can use within your environments. Have any of your organizations ever banned the use of an open source component just by show of hands? There are some bad ones out there. We have a couple. Single component, a library, Dependencies. Which ones? Anything 
license. So based on license, sure. Based on license, right? So it doesn't have to be simply security risk. What is security risk? Business, okay. business security? It's business security. It's yeah. Security. Left, yeah. So about 70, I think it was 76% of the organizations in our survey had never banned an open source component within their, uh, their portfolios. Although when we looked at it, we had organizations with 57% of the organizations that we surveyed had an open source policy in place. 43% of those organizations still do not have an open source policy in place. So even, even as we've introduced guidelines through OWASP or PCI about vulnerable components, we still don't have exactly um, governance practices uh, around those. So uh, Matt, I'll pose the question to you. Is it, is it time for more diligence or are we simply better off than we were before? Uh, I mean, 43% is still a pretty big number, right? And also, uh, you know, does, does your organization have a policy is pretty broad, right? Does that policy say, go ahead and use whatever you want, wherever you want? <laughs> That's a policy, right? Yeah, we didn't ask if it was written down. <laughs> was it a, is it, it a restrictive was... policy? Is it a kind of whatever, right? But yeah, barring that, I mean, uh, time for more diligence? Sure, just time for, I, I, another part of this question would be like, okay, do, do you have a policy? Do you know what it is? Right? So yeah, I know we have one, but whatever, right? Is it followed up on? Is it checked? It like, uh, is there any sort of tool that you're using that is checking new libraries that are being entered in, or did someone just install some gem at some point to make some part easier, and who knows what it was, right? Yeah, if, if I remember the stat, I think 68% of the people that said that they had an open source policy actually followed it. So we did ask a question, <laughs> if you have a policy, do yeah. you follow it? And we only had about 68% answering that that way. Um, Jeff, what, what guidance would you provide someone? So you're sitting out there in the audience, based on the percentages, 40% of you out there might not have an open source policy. What guidance would you give them to, you know, is now the time to start or where, where would you start? I mean, I think having a policy like OWASP A9 that says you shouldn't use components with known vulnerabilities is like the lowest bar you could put in place. And any company that's not doing that, I think, is being pretty irresponsible. That said, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I, I don't think that this is the apocalypse. I think that there are vulnerabilities in components, uh, but that they're one part of the application security picture and that it's something you need to get a handle on as well as all the other stuff in the OS top 10 and ASBS and other stuff. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's one part of a well-balanced breakfast. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I think, you know, clearly if you look around the vendors on the, the show floor here, there are a lot of different angles and a lot of different techniques that we can use across the software development life cycle, e even for applications that are in production where different techniques can find different vulnerabilities or identify different risks. So there's not a one layer solution or a one approach solution that finds all risk within. No, and this is getting way different now, especially with you know, people pushing code multiple times a day or week. Uh, these, these new libraries can just pop up out of nowhere mm -hmm. really, really easily without any sort of you know, change control or anything like that, which I'm not saying is necessarily all a bad thing, right? code is changing faster, which is great, which means you can fix it faster That's also right. if you That's find right. a problem. But the policy is not a one size fits all, right? If this gets in, because if, you, if you're going to try to be the security guy that says, hey, we can't introduce any new library like ever, right? You're going to get laughed out of the room, right? Yeah. If, if someone's pushing 30 times a day, like there's going to be really, it's going to be really hard to restrict that. So I think just monitoring what you have and just knowing what your attack surface is, is just going to be 80% of it, right? It's going to be a lot of the fight. The, the really good thing about this problem is that it is something you can monitor 30, 30 times a day pushes. I mean, sure. it's really not <laughs> tremendously expensive to say, hey, which of these libraries have known vulnerabilities and get real-time alerts. You can break builds. There's a lot of things that, you know, it, very compatible with the DevOps-style yeah. development uh, that you can do. So, we're, we're, Josh, we're, we're one year into A9. Where, where do you think this 
you know, we improved over last year, right, from 57% didn't have a, a policy to 43%. In three years from now, are we a lot better, or do you see a slow curve on this? It, I think it's a slow curve. It's really positive that 89 is on the list. Um, it's catalyzed a lot of conversation. I think the, the recognition and adjustments are not evenly distributed. Uh, the financial services, uh, ISAC, published a really good white paper based on A9 and adaptations, in part because they helped in the crafting of A9, but in part because they all had material breaches due to struts or something like that. So their compelling event, it was their slammer, so to speak, just like Microsoft got religion after slammer and blaster and whatnot, they kind of got religion after a couple really big breaches. But I think it's unevenly distributed. And you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. So I like the fact that we're socializing this more. I think as much as you get annoyed that Heartbleed had a pretty logo, um, it did a tremendous amount to raise awareness on that you can implement SSL correctly and still have a massive security incident. Yeah. Um, how many of you are from an organization with over 100 developers? Okay, so a little, a little stat when we did some splices of the data for organizations over 100 developers, 77% of you have an open source policy in place. So the bigger the organization, usually the more mature the operations. That kind of goes across any part of the business that bigger organizations are typically more mature. Uh, but still, you know, 77%, that's good. It's better than it was, but. Yeah, just based on, that sounds like theory great, but I think based on experience or folks working in large organizations will find that the bigger the organization, yes, the better policies are there. There's probably a manual and a book on and a policy on everything, <laughs> but that's so far disconnected and removed from the people actually doing the work that it's either rarely relevant or they're unaware of it or it just doesn't match up with how they, with how they work. So in my experience, I see that you know, smaller organizations are much better about this because they're able to often, they're often working in a more kind of holistic Somebody has, they, they have the end-to-end -end view of the system because, hey, it's, you know, there's 50 people in our company, we're all in the same building or maybe we all get on the same, same hangouts or whatever it might be, and we have that same general awareness. Um, big organizations, you just get, you know, the worsening of those silo effects, which anytime you take the decision making and the policing away from the people who have all the context and all, all, of, the, all of the actual hands on the keyboard control, um, things, things break down. That's just how it goes. Yeah. So I want to shift gears a little just on participants. So you bring up, you know, who do we actually know in the organization that's following the, the policy? When we ask who in your organization has the primary responsibility for open source policy or governance, the answers were kind of all over the place. I know it's a little more difficult for you guys to see, but 34% application development, management, 24% IT architecture, 5% security, 3% risk and compliance. So answers were all over the place. Some part of our initial reaction seeing this information said, if everyone's in charge, then maybe no one's in charge. So um, Damon, if you look from a DevOps perspective, who's ultimately in charge of, or who ultimately needs to be in charge of the policies or the governance? Well, I think there's this notion of, you know, shift left, right? If, if you look at the end, if you look at the, sort of shift left, um, if you look at the, uh, at the life cycle, uh, everything has a, a um, uh, you know, a development and a publishing or, or deployment phase, right? So kind of, kind of left to right life cycle. And the people on the left, the people that create the thing, have to be the ones in charge of that thing. There's just no other way to, to separate ownership away from um, you can't say you have ownership over this thing, but somebody else is going to own the security of it. Someone else is going to own the quality. Someone's going to own the operations. It just things, you know, things break apart, and uh, you get those bad, those bad silo <coughs> effects. So if anybody has to own it, it has to be, I, I believe, the developer. The development teams, the, the people who, 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 who own the application. But I think the problem with most organizations is nobody actually owns the application, right? So you got a dev team. They're on something. They did something. Great. We're done. Now it's SRE's job or ops's job to, to take care of it. I'm on to the next business priority, and uh, you see that that the same issue. So I, I think there's this, there's a larger ownership issue than just security in an organization. But I think if security professionals want to make themselves more relevant to the broader organization, help jump in, into into the middle of that conversation because it's going on you know all over the place. Because as people move faster, it's one that thing that's tripping them up and causing them to to fall. Jeff, so. I think putting primary responsibility on the software developers 
is absolutely the right thing to do. But you've got to arm them with the right tools right. so that they can actually do it. If you try to do this problem by hand, it's horrific. It means that you have to go search Secunia and OSVDB and CVE and all mailing lists and try to figure out which libraries you're actually using and which matches up to what, ha you know, SHA-1 hash and the thing. And it, it's terrible. I know organizations that have teams of people that are, you know, going around to software project to software project, trying to figure this out by hand, figure out which ones have known vulnerabilities, and it's terrible. So it, they need automation mm -hmm. right on the ground while they're developing so they can get instant feedback on the libraries that they choose and the versions of the libraries that they choose. Yeah, I, I think the role of the security professional has to shift to being toolsmiths and coaches. Right? They have to get out of the day-to-day yeah. -day trenches of doing the work and say, our job is to, we build a service, you know, not pick, just pick a tool, but we build a holistic service that others in our organization can use to do the security work, and we're going to coach you on how to use it, um, but we're not going to do it for you because we just can't keep up, and, we, and we, we, we're never going to have enough context to do it, to do it right. Tomorrow we have, in this, ro this room all day, is a DevOps track with speakers like Damon, uh, David Mortman, um, and in that, we're essentially talking about when you accelerate to the, the, the velocity of DevOps, you have to automate things. And we list about uh, a bunch of different innovative tools that have come out of these shops, like Breakman at Twitter does an instantaneous tight feedback loop of a bunch of sanity checks. James Wickett from the OWASP community has written Gauntlet with some other folks. These are things like Chaos Monkey and the like. So these are opportunities where a security person actually made it very DevOps friendly, and these were injection points into the normal workflow. Um, and we're spending all day tomorrow <laughs> kind of guiding people through how that's working. Did you have a question or comment? I, I did. Uh, it sounds like we're dancing around the fact that when dealing with libraries in general, actually open source, this is an asset management problem. Asset management? Asset management. I mean, this isn't fundamentally, it sounds mm. fundamentally not all that different than the, the problem that infrastructure people have knowing how many servers do I have? Oh, you mean like a change mm. management database type? I, it's yeah. just an asset management database. Yeah. What library? Mm -hmm. Like, I work for a large software hardware company, and we produce 100, over 100 products, and we had at least 30 that had OpenSSL in it. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I guarantee mm -hmm. there was at least five different versions of OpenSSL we knew. So, yeah, so the, the fact that we knew that was a miracle. Does this resonate? Um, it, so yeah, DHS. My question yeah. Is, is what recommendations do you have for organizations on just tracking this, figuring out what you have and how do you track it? But one of the areas Jeff and I. Yeah, one of the areas we totally agree is we think um, the answer isn't necessarily a lot more security, it's more transparency. Um, and the way that uh, DHS had a really hard time, specifically they took six weeks to determine which government sites had SSL in it. Right. And um, they're actually asking for a huge budget to spend a lot of money on security people. And what we said is, you know, we got to stop looking at this as an AppSec problem and more like a supply chain problem. <coughs> like their hardest question was, am I affected by Heartbleed? And they couldn't answer for six weeks. And the second question was, where am I affected by Heartbleed? If you treated this like a Toyota, you know, Deming type supply chain management thing, you'd know your supply from your suppliers and which parts were defective and which batches they made it into. You could do targeted recalls, so to speak. So I do think some of this is our shift to maybe equip the transparency, the bill of materials, uh, and the tracking so that you can actually have a more elegant supply chain manager. Yeah, so it, it's actually a good transition to the next stat, which, which is, it, it was a question that was really focused on development about how does your open source policy address security vulnerabilities? 41% said, it says we must avoid using known vulnerabilities. 21% said we must prove that we're not using known vulnerabilities, right? So there, there's the, kind of A9 approach, if you will, don't, you shouldn't use these no open source components with known vulnerabilities, or is it you must prove that you're actually using these assets, if you will, and the, the commentary up front was about, you know, is this an asset management uh, problem? So, you know, Jeff, if we look at the clients that you're working with and some of the kind of practical challenges that they're facing with insecure components, what, what could you share? Well, what I'd say about, about this question is I'm, I'm a huge advocate of proof. I come from an a older generation of application security, uh, orange book level kind of 
Security where you did have to prove things, and I, I don't really believe security if it's not, if there's no evidence of it, right? And so to say something's secure and not have evidence supporting your assertion is, I, I don't know, I don't believe it. It's like I wouldn't believe you if you told me a, a car is safe, I want to see the test results, right? I mean, I don't really think security exists in any other form than the proof. So to me, if you don't have the proof, you don't have security. But, uh, you know, I've had arguments with Josh about this. Uh, I think he's on the other side of the, the question and would say that, you know, you get security by being in a lot of street fights and you know, no, beating no, stuff no, up. No. But, I mean, it, it's a different kind of, uh, of approach to the problem. I, I do think uh, proof means that you view the problem as a positive security model. And it means that you're, you're, you have an assertion that you want to support and you're providing, you know, you, you're providing evidence that, that builds that. That's something that you can build in a DevOps organization. You can generate proof. It's a security thing to generate that. You can build it and test it and know you've got it. And the negative approach to security, which basically everybody follows, doesn't give you that assurance. All you end up with is a big pile of vulnerabilities and no confidence that the thing is secure. So and I'd like to flip the switch on that. Like that that's, it's time to go positive. And I don't think you're going to ever have one or the other. And uh, I don't think it's a disagreement. I think it's a compliment. Um, I think you should have a thesis that you can articulate as to why you believe this thing is defensible. And you should be able to uh, stand up in a fight, which is one of the reasons why you see a bunch of PCI compliant organizations, and then they have the they run Metasploit against it after they pass, and they can't stop a single thing. So you can have the thesis that we're compliant, and we can demonstrate proof of compliance. We have a report on compliance, and then today's Metasploit knocks it down. So I think it's an and. Um, but I also know that at the DevOps velocity or these startups, these Indiegogo Kickstarters, they're not going to provide proof. So I. I both want what you're suggesting for the, the higher rigor organizations or cars or medical devices and industrial controls. And I know that um, in some cases it's gonna be more like the chaos monkey model, where if you just like bombard these things with failures, you'll, you'll get stronger over time. We had, we had a question down here from the audience. Yes. That's what I was just about to yeah. say. I was what about kind of to say the same thing. It's like, okay, you so what, what kind of proof, proof is the, uh, to is be the run, question? Do we run a scan? What's scanned? Is, that, is this proof? Here's this report is clear. Formal right? methods. I don't I wouldn't go that far, but I think it's reasonable to say, you know, show me some evidence that you have the right defenses in place that, that defend against the attacks that you expect on the system, that those defenses actually work, and that they're present in all the places where they need to be in the application to actually do the job. Mm -hmm. and those things are simple. I mean, it's not hard to generate that proof, really. It's, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, it's much simpler than doing. Uh, I, I like the literature. intent of his. Yeah, it's just, just whether or not yeah. that proof is good enough. But yeah, it's very simple to to prove that. You know, hey, we just introduced this open source library and it passed all of our tests, and here's our proof, right? I mean, it's a great idea, right? But it just has to be good enough proof. Yeah. <laughs> It wouldn't be those things. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see I'd, l I'd like to see an assurance argument that says, "Hey, this application has the right defenses in place that they work and that they're properly configured and, and so on." An it's really model. And I can hand you a thousand organizations who have been a PCI efficient, so I want to know yeah. what is what is sufficient for you? What what is the standard that is sufficient for you that will make you feel happy to know? But to say certain proof <laughs> is, is crap. That's, that's all proof. Yeah. That's kind of <laughs> and it's funny because we, you guys were using manufacturing, which I love in comparison, but here's what's funny. You have 20 years of development models and IT service management models that are based on manufacturing that we could use yeah. instead of trying to say compare it to the manufacturing model. I, I like the visualization, but there's all of this stuff already built. But we're always trying to do our new thing. But it, I mean, the, the reason the, the car one works well, the Toyota yeah. one, is um, you know the recent airbag defective, the defective airbags? It would be criminal negligence to continue using that right now. Yep. Whereas it's not criminal negligence to keep using the one year old vulnerable version of struts from last July. Well, it's like <laughs> the older version of the Kaizen, right? What? Kaizen. Okay. So the ability for anybody to be able to stop the line. 
Yeah, the, yeah. the end on Gordon, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's not negligent to continue to use open SSL today. I mean, in a you know policy sense or in a and I'm not legal necessarily arguing for that. Sense. I'm saying, um, but here's the thing: the art, it was a metaphor, but now that there's open source software in cars, it's not. It's no longer a metaphor. It's literal. Like, so. Right. I yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's uh, let's switch over to a uh, production view, and and so this is. Uh, open source component risk and actively monitoring components for changes in vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. So I've scanned my application however I want to scan it today, um, and I see, hey, we don't have any known vulnerabilities I can identify, right? Are we keeping track of those? So 63% said we're not tracking changes in vulnerability data over time. I mean, this isn't even Matt, unique to sure. open source, right? Like, yeah. this isn't unique right. to open source. Like, th this is just a metric that, that you know, it's just that I'm, I'm sure those percentages would, would translate across vulnerability data for your network, your servers, your application, whatever, right? Uh, it's, it's hard to track that metric uh, if, it, you know, if you're not using the right tool set and you're not, if you're trying to do this by hand, we've brought this up before, right? Even Dave said, okay, how many servers do I have, right? I don't know. That's a crazy, <laughs> crazy hard question to answer. One of the hardest questions that, we have to answer why hat or that we have to have our customers answer is how many websites do I have? Right. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's super super easy to stand this stuff up now. You can just spin up an AWS something or other in some department, right? Like, who knows where that stuff is living? So okay, good luck tracking the stuff that you don't even know about, right? Yeah. So yeah, you can track your vuln data of the stuff you know about, but then there's <laughs> the the world that you have no idea, right? But, yeah, so. I mean there so there are clearly supply chains out in the world in different industries, man, auto manufacturing, one pharmaceuticals you know, life sciences, right. you name it, they can track every single part that's gone out across an organization over time and understand, you know, if beef went out, right, and this still amazes me, beef went out from some factory in Iowa six months ago and it had this serial number on the package, that they can track every known package to every store that went out and right. say, we're gonna recall this beef in this store with this serial number that that tracking is you know, taking and, place. And, and there's a reason for that. I think this is something that this is a, you see a shift in the IT industry that we do it wrong, right? Where asset management, like I think, of course, like security, like quality, you know, something that happens after the fact, documentation, right? <laughs> it's a thing we're always trying to catch later, like, oh, let's, let me do my cleanup and catch up, and let me, or let me have some special tool that's going to go on and, and inspect my environments and try to figure out what's out there. Then I can compile this big database of what's actually out there. And we're always chasing our tail, and we never get anywhere, right? It's been, you know, how many, how many, every, everywhere we go, a CMDB is, is right around the corner, right? It's going to be in six months. Come back six months, it's going to be six more months. It's never quite working. It's a standalone project. Smartest minds are on it. Nobody's actually getting there. And I think you need to rethink it and how they do it in the car industry, the beef industry. They're tracking it at the source. They have the records at the source. So if you look at kind of what sort of these newer, um, you know, I hate to overuse the word DevOps here, but you know, kind of very continuous delivery friendly DevOpsy, uh, call it the Indiegogo Kickstarter crowd. Uh, the way they see their, um, their, 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 their world is you have a source specification and you have a build process. That's it, right? And that's for a application changes, for infrastructure changes. Um, they're trying to drive everything to where we're arguing over a specification in source somewhere at the source. And then we have a build process that that push button that that when I say build, I mean actually building and deploying. You know, think of your entire environment, software environment, as a software stack. Like you're building a piece of software, but I'm building a data center, um, and it all comes from one from from one source. So, if you tr unless you solve the problem at the source, you're always going to be chasing your tail trying to trying to figure out what the hell happened after the fact. So and now things are exploding. You'll never Josh, you'll never do it. Just, uh, I mean, building on the the operational use of a bill of materials helps here as well, right? So if you know what you built it from, then you can operationally notice that new vulnerabilities introduced against that list are now uh, a continuous governance process. And um, your point about uh, the DevOps pushing the buttons and whatnot, um, oh darn it, I lost my thought. You had I, to I was just gonna say, you know, not every project is DevOps yet. No. I mean, I think there's some nice opportunities in DevOps processes to instrument the build and yeah. you know, the, that process to, to build your asset database and so on, but not every 
application is built that way, and we need to support the 90% of legacy apps that are out there that have this code in it, and they're not monitoring those apps for new vulnerabilities. Even if they did scan it when it went live, that scan is out of date within a week. Yeah, but that's right? what I'm saying. So it's no you're not only scanning of, code, you're, you're actually just made it, you know, I know what it was going to be. When he said not, how many people are like almost to a CMDB, there's one answer to it. It's all the high performing IT shops, right? Like when Gene Kim did the Visible Apps book, of, of the 115 different things they tracked, the three most common things were do you know what you have, do you know when it changes, and you have zero unplanned changes. And that same rigor applied to our software supply chain assembly line, our factory line. So, so what, what's interesting to me about this problem is it's actually really easy to gather data about what libraries you're using. Yeah. And a simple agent deployed on app servers can report back and build your inventory in minutes. So, I mean, it's really not that hard to assemble a good inventory if you can just say, put a little agent on every box that's out there. And, you know, that's, that's tough. I'm not saying that's simple. Yeah. Right. But if you can enforce that far, your standard build in Puppet sure. pushes the, the or chef or pushes that agent, then everything reports in and you've got an accurate inventory everywhere. Yeah. So, um, well, I, I know we're running closer to be, being uh, short on time or getting toward the, the end of the session, but I know there was a, a question in the survey that um, a lot of you wanted time to comment <laughs> on, and that was, you know, where do you see uh, in the development process in your organization, where is application security performed, and is it none at all a manual process or automated? And the blue bar, for those of you back in the back of the room, that's where the manual processes are. And from you know, left to right of the software development life cycle. So there's a lot of manual answers in here. That's scary. Damon, is, is that uh, sustainable in your world? I, I don't think it's sustainable at all. I mean, that's one of those things where you, know, you look at what happened in, uh, with QA, right? I mean, something we've feel fought this argument over and over again, well, you must have manual testing. And a lot of companies have proved that the ones that don't, that, that rely on automated testing, that literally have the idea that a manual test is not, um, is not something that's, 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 uh, that's reliable, uh, they, you know, they uh, achieve far greater quality through reliance, through mandating everything must be driven through automated, through, 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 uh, through automa automated testing. And your manual testing is things you do um, around, the, uh, around the edges. Yeah, so Matt from... I mean, you need to do both, right? You can't rely on one or the other, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then very obviously, I mean, it, it's been said a few times up here already, right? you got to move left. This is what he was talking about by moving left, right? Yeah. Uh, right it's right cool now, automated is more right than it's It's almost not even existent. On and that the makes left. sense. That makes sense. There's the, you know, the, the, tool, the tool landscape hasn't caught up to moving left yet. You know, things like Gauntlet right. are coming out, things like Chaos Monkey are coming out, so that automation is is seeping its way into QA and prior, uh, but any, any you know, the majority of the automation out there is in pre-prod production and, and later, right? So yeah. that makes sense, but yeah, we absolutely need to move, move automation further left. Jeff? So I've spent the, the vast majority of my career doing manual security, lots of code reviews, thousands of applications, and um, there are quite a lot of vulnerabilities that you really can't find with generic tools, right? Just generic scanners that don't know anything about the application. Um, I liked what you said earlier about application guys changing from doing the work to becoming, uh, you know, coaches and uh, what was the other word? Toolsmiths. Tool Toolsmiths. Toolsmiths. And I think that's really the future. Uh, there, there are a lot of things that you'll never find with a generic tool. Uh, authentication problems, access control problems, and encryption problems top the list. You'll never find them with a generic tool. Um, but you can change the way you do pen tests from the way you do it now, where you do a pen test and you report a vulnerability, to doing a pen test or a code review, and instead of producing a dumb PDF report that nobody wants, produce a little piece of automation. Produce a signature for your tool or a Unit small test. tool to verify it. And it com comes back to that positive thing. You can write a positive tool to verify how it, that application is really supposed to work. And then from then on, that tool gets run as part of of dev, test, QA, CI, and, and maybe even prod. Um, that's, that's the way this thing actually moves left. And over time, you build an immune system. Yeah. Correct. I mean, yeah, our, so uh, ultimately the approach is the fingers on keyboards, right? Yeah. So to me, every time I'm trying to drive something into this problem, I, it's like when you're su choosing the component to build your stuff, I want actionable intelligence that this thing has known vulnerabilities or known GPL risk so that you can completely avoid 
potential rework or risk later. Yeah, Mozilla is doing a really cool thing, by the yeah. way. If you deliver a vulnerability to Mozilla, they want it in Zest, which is a scripting language that runs in Zap so that they can instantly reproduce it. Yes, but sir. it's a formal way of delivering security findings as opposed to just, you know, writing up a vuln. Yeah, who's trying to do Selenium scripts for their bug bounty as well. Yeah, so I, very there. cool trend. I think that, you know, for building on some of the commentary here, I, I think there's a growing need for application security to really provide the guidance and, and direction around how we should do application security, what kinds of things we should look for where. But if we're going to shift left within the organizations, we have to do that in the developer's role. You can't shift left without the enforcement or the, you know, let's go along with the rules being at the developer. And, you know, the application security professionals really providing that guidance of, you know, what, uh, what should we be doing and what should we be looking out for. So um, just with a minute left, if you want all of the survey results, they are available online um, right now, sonatype.com slash 2014 survey. So it's very easy to find. You'll find all 28 questions. We've only covered about six of them here. I recommend you know, going to the site, getting uh, no registration required uh, to get it and view that, bring it to your organization, have a discussion like this and figure out where does your organization need to be? What kind of guidelines do you want to put in place? How do you want to change things? You know, where do we want to be in this position for next year? The other thing I will say, if you didn't get enough of our panelists, uh, later this afternoon, Josh and Matt are speaking both at three o'clock, so you'll have to decide by maybe <laughs> length of beard. Who's, <laughs> who's, I got this one. <laughs> yeah, that's an older picture of Matt where we, we didn't older. have the colored in version. You of looked the, happy uh, back then. The yeah, longer yeah. version. And then <laughs> Jeff and Damon are also talking tomorrow afternoon. So. Thank you again for our panelists. I really appreciate your perspective. Thank you.